Sorry. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I will be talking to you today about the role of CT in evaluation of RV. Um, we were going to do a combined lecture with me and Dr. Shah, and he was going to talk about the MRI, but he will give you guys a separate lecture, I think January 3rd. Um, so my talk may not take the full hour. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the first thing I want to say, which most of you already know, is um, why CT for evaluation of RV function, and do we actually even use that for evaluation of RV function? And the answer is, yes, we do. It is not first line. Um, as you know, cardiac MRI is the gold standard for evaluation of RV volumes and function. Um, and of course, our first line is echocardiography. But CT does have its role for certain indications. And in my talk, I will go over some of those indications and show you some of the publications, the data to support those indications, and then show you a couple of examples of um, RV evaluation um, from cases from our uh, CT service. Um, so I will start by this uh, mentioning this really nice review by uh, Dr. Rebecca Hahn that was actually just published in March of this year um, as a JAX scientific statement. It goes over the multimodality imaging of right heart function. Um, and the goal of the paper is to review the standard and novel imaging methods for assessing RV function. And they then go on and do a nice job discussing um, the different RV parameters from different modalities and their association with outcomes and a variety of cardiovascular uh, conditions. Um, here's a nice figure that I borrowed from that paper. Um, in the center, you can see these are all the different key uh, pathologies that it's extremely important to have a good look at RV for. Uh, that includes pulmonary hypertension, both right and left heart failure, different cardiomyopathies, congenital heart disease, um, and valvular heart disease. Um, with CT, just like with MRI, if you have a retrospective uh, gated scan of a, and have all the cardiac cycles, you can get right ventricular volumes and ejection fraction. Uh, and then also it will delineate the anatomy very well to look at the relationship of the right ventricle with the neighboring structures, uh, connections to the pulmonary arteries, especially in congenital cases. Um, ECHO, of course, has its role, its first line, and the parameters that we use today for RV function are the TAPSI, the tissue Doppler of the RV free wall, free wall strain, and then the new softwares can give us 3D ejection fraction for the RV as well. Um, cardiac MRI, as I mentioned, is the gold standard. Um, you acquire the images, and then you do the, um, all the fellows know this, you know, you trace the boundaries and systole and diastole, and you have very accurate RV volumes and uh, estimates of RV ejection fraction. The uh, one thing I will mention is there is a paucity of data for the normative data for right ventricle for CT. So a lot of the times they're borrowing the data that we have for cardiac MRI. Um, there's literally just a handful of small studies that kind of try to establish the normative data for RV by CT, uh, but not enough to make it um, something that you should look up as standard reference values. Um, in this paper, they go over the strengths and limitations of the different modalities for, uh, for evaluation of right ventricular function. Here's the column for the CT. Of course, the strength is that unlike echo, it's independent of geometric assumptions and free from acoustic window limitations. Um, you acquire a 3D data set, you can manipulate it whichever way you want. Uh, the limitations, of course, are that uh, it's costly, there is radiation involved, there is uh, contrast involved, and actually, if you want to look at the RV um, as well, you need to give contrast for a longer period of time. Uh, it is dependent on having a stable cardiac rhythm. Um, and a temporal resolution of CT, of course, is way lower than what echo is, um, and that's just the limitation of the technology. Um, and then, you know, in a nutshell, in their paper, they're saying it can be used in patients undergoing CT for other clinical indications. For example, patients having CT for um, 
valve procedures before TAVR or TTVR. Uh, and then they do emphasize what I already mentioned, that CT is not the first-line modality for evaluation of RV function, and MRI is the gold standard. But it is a valuable alternative in patients who have insufficient echo um, windows uh, and information, uh, or the cardiac MRI is uh, contraindicated. There is data for uh, some data in certain conditions for the association of different CT uh, right ventricular parameters with outcomes. Um, we have, uh, in a, a, all the TAVR uh, CT reports that you guys see, we give the RV and the LV function because all these scans are retrospectively gated scans. And actually in these aortic stenosis patients, there are studies that have looked at the prognostic value of um, these three right ventricular indications, the right ventricular volume index, ejection fraction, and there is a way to do the strain if you have the software package with CT as well. An RV volume index greater than 120 mLs per meter square was um, independently associated with increased risk of one-year mortality in patients undergoing TAVR. An EF less than 50% from another study was an independent predictor of all-cause mortality and death. Uh, and um, if your uh, RV strain by CT was worse than 11.42%, one of the studies showed it was an independent predictor of all-cause mortality. Um, these are all in TAVR patients. Another paper that has looked at outcomes has been in um, patients who underwent CT before uh, percutaneous tricuspid valve replacements, TTVR. And uh, they looked at uh, CT parameters that are independent predictors for post-operative RV dysfunction in patients undergoing tricuspid valve surgery. And um, they looked at the tricuspid valve annulus diameter. This is how they made it from the four-chamber view. Um, and then also uh, by reconstructing a long axis view of the right atrium, right ventricle. And in this particular case, actually the values are uh, the same. Um, this is an unfast view for the tricuspid annulus where they uh, measure the major and the minor diameter and calculate something called the sphericity index. Um, and from this uh, paper, they showed that a tricuspid valve annular diameter greater than 29.3 millimeters per meter square from a four chamber view was associated with worse outcomes post op. Um, as well as an RV um, and diastolic volume index greater than 128.8. So that was a couple of um, publications talking about the outcomes. Um, this is a very nice review of, uh, of from um, JCCT um, from one of my prior colleagues, Quinn Trong, uh, looking at talking about the analysis uh, of both right and left ventricular function by uh, cardiac CT. Of course, most of the reviews taken up by the LV, uh, but again, they mentioned that cardiac CT is an alternative option for RV uh, function evaluation. Um, however, um, adequate contrast enhancement of the RV lumen is required. So um, these are the main key points for our CT protocol if uh, evaluation of the right ventricular structure and function is also desired. You gotta have a CT that's at least 64 slice. You know, we take that for granted at Houston Methodist, but in real world, people, some folks still have 16 slice CTs. Um, the contrast rate that we use for typically our coronary studies has to be at least five ml per second. Um, you can get away with lower contrast rates if you are doing CT just for that indication of uh, evaluation of uh, right and left ventricular function, but it's rare that you get an indication just for that reason. Um, there is retrospective EKG gating required to acquire all phases of the cardiac cycle, hence the increased radiation dose. A lot of scanners have tube modulation um, techniques where it's gonna drop your milliamps during the systolic phases to reduce the radiation dose, but still give you images that are diagnostic enough to draw your um, LV and RV contours in the systolic phases. Um, the contrast is typically time for the arterial phase, which is how we scan all the coronaries, uh, which is basically that the scan acquisition starts four to five seconds after the peak aortic opacification. But in order to uh, look at the RV, you need 
at least additional 10 seconds of contrast injection. It can be at a slower rate or uh, frequently uh, following the first contrast bolus, there is a chaser of a saline and contrast uh, mix at the same rate that's given for another 10 to 15 seconds. The image processing and reconstruction is done with the help of whatever CT software that you're using. Uh, for coronaries, remember, we look at very thin slices with the highest possible spatial resolution, 0.5 millimeter slices. Um, with, uh, for evaluation of uh, RV and LV function, you can have slices that are even up to 1.5 millimeters. Um, the, this is important to understand. So the reconstructions are done every 10% of the cardiac cycle on a single source CT. Uh, but for the dual source CTs, which is the Siemens scanner, which is what we have over here, uh, we do the reconstructions at 5% increments. And uh, the reason for that is the difference in the temporal resolution. Uh, the single slice CTs have a temporal resolution of about 160 to 170 milliseconds. So if you have a patient with a heart rate of 60 beats per minute, for example, uh, and you're dividing that into 10 phases, each phase, the, the, the time difference between each phase is about 100 milliseconds. Now that's good enough because your, the temporal resolution of your system is 160, 170, so you're not gaining anything by constructing it every 5%. However, you know, the big advantage of our dual source uh, Siemens scanner is uh, with the dual source technology, the temporal resolution is cut in half or even more than, uh, less than in half. Um, and in the temporal resolution typically on the scanners is in the 60 to 70 millisecond range. So then it does make sense to construct the images every 5% to take full advantage of the temporal resolution of the scanner. Uh, the way the RV uh, function evaluation is done is similar to those, uh, you know, the, the fellows that have done this for cardiac MRI. The software will trace in the basal, mid, and the apical slices uh, the boundaries of the uh, right ventricular uh, endocardium at end systole and end diastole, um, and then give you the RV volumes and the ejection fraction. Uh, the automated uh, softwares, of course, will give you right away the RV and LV function. For the most, just like MRI softwares, for CT softwares as well, the LV tracings for the most part are good to go, but the, uh, the automated RV tracings may require a significant amount of editing, so if it can be time consuming if you want to do it accurately. So this is, in a nutshell, the different indications uh, where or clinical scenarios where evaluation of RV function by CT can be useful. Uh, as we mentioned already, patients with inadequate in echo information and contraindications to getting a cardiac MRI. Uh, these could be patients uh, with pacemakers and defibrillators where, uh, yes, we have more and more devices that are MR compatible now, but uh, the MR images, uh, especially for the right ventricle, if the leads are sitting in the RA and RV, may still not be uh, very good. Patients with com complex adult congenital heart disease uh, may benefit from CT for looking at the RV. Um, especially if some of these patients have hardware, uh, pacemakers, and ICDs. Um, and people have, uh, you know, for example, uh, patients who are followed up with cardiac MRIs for tetralogy of fellow, and they may develop pulmonic regurgitation over time. Um, we base the timing of the pulmonic valve replacement on the right ventricular end systolic and end diastolic volume indexes. Now, that data is all from MRI literature. But uh, for patients who cannot undergo MRI, people have used the same cutoffs for the RV um, and systolic and volume indexes for uh, making decisions uh, based on CT uh, regarding the timing of pulmonic valve replacement. And the reason for that is that we actually do have good studies, good data showing that there is very good correlation between the ejection fraction and the volumes obtained um, with CT uh, for RV uh, compared with cardiac MRI. Uh, another indication is assessment of RV function in patients with LVADs. We will talk about that. Assessment of ARVD, CT can play a role in that, and I'll show an example of that. Uh, and then additional information regarding RV size and function in patients undergoing CT for valve medications like TAVR and TTVR, and I showed you some of the outcome data 
which can contribute to um, further clinical decision making from the reports. So we always give it in the reports. Once you have acquired a retrospective acquisition for evaluation of RV and LV function, uh, the software will generate these curves. This is, these are the different phases of the cardiac cycle, and this is the volume of the right ventricle. Here's end systole, here's end diastole. And then both for the left ventricle and the right ventricle, it'll give you the volumes, the ejection fraction, and then if you enter the BSAL index, all that for you. Uh, the boundaries are drawn at end diastole and end systole. This is for the RV, this is for the LV. And if you want to calculate the mass, the left ventricular mass, then you have to draw the epicardial contours as well. Um, here is um, an example of uh, a scan that was done uh, on a TAVR patient uh, last month. Uh, and you can see uh, the images are quite good for evaluating RV function. The delineation of the endocardial border is uh, maybe just as good as what you see with a cardiac MRI. Note how the RV is opacified, so the contrast has, has, has been run for a longer period of time. And then we have the dual source scanners here, so the uh, uh, reconstructions here are every 15%, and that you feed into the software. Um, to calculate the volumes and the ejection fraction. Um, here is a basal slice, here is a mid-ventricular slice, um, and then here is a slice at the apex, uh, and the software, just like for MRI, will go over the slices and draw the borders and um, give you the volumes and ejection fraction. So um, what is the correlation between RV and the goals, uh, by uh, correlation between CT and the gold standard MRI for RV ejection fraction and RV volumes. Uh, this is a nice study uh, uh, from 2010 in International Journal of Cardiology done actually in China that compared uh, 47 consecutive subjects who had a retrospective CT done with a 64 slice scanner and also had a cardiac MRI within two weeks of each other. Um, to look at the reliability of the CT and the uh, CT measurements, they looked at the intra-observer and inter-observer variability, um, and then of course MRI served as the reference standard. Um, so here are the linear regression graphs for the different um, parameters on CT and diastolic volume and systolic volume, stroke volume and ejection fraction, um, and there's actually a good correlation uh, between all of these parameters uh, obtained by CT versus cardiac MRI, which is on the x-axis. And in the red here are the Pearson correlation coefficients, which are all um, 0.9 or more, showing good uh, correlation. Um, to look at the intra-observer and inter-observer variability, here is the analysis with the, uh, the bland artman plots. So just to recap, the solid line represents the mean difference between the two modalities. Uh, and the dotted lines are the 95% confidence interval, so you want most, more, most of the dots following between the 95% confidence, confidence intervals, uh, which is what they saw for all these uh, four parameters, um, uh, uh, indicating good correlation between um, uh, CT and MRI. Uh, and these are uh, the values for the inter-observer and intra-observer variability p-value not being significant uh, for most of them. So the inter-observer variability of CT, at least according to this study, they actually said it was better than MRI, and the intra-observer variability tended to be slightly lower with CT, but both were in an acceptable range. So this meta-analysis um, in Korean Journal of Radiology uh, took all the studies that have looked at this question, 766 patients from 20 studies were included in this meta-analysis. And again, they looked at the four parameters um, uh, obtained from CT and diastolic volume, systolic volume, stroke volume, and injection fraction, and correlated them with cardiac MRI. And the correlation coefficients, again, much higher sample size here from the meta-analysis was very good. All right, let's move on to one of the indications we talked about, which is the role of uh, CT for RV evaluation in LVAT patients. So as you all know, RV failure is a major contributor to morbidity and mortality after LVAD implantation, and hence the accurate evaluation of RV structure and function is very important uh, post-LVAD. Uh, and 
from the echo images, you all know the images can be challenging. Yes, there could be some windows where you get a glimpse of the RV function, but you're not going to have uh, the usual parameters with nice, apical uh, four-chamber views uh, to evaluate the RV function. Uh, so this study from the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplantation looked at the utility of CT for evaluation of RV um, after uh, L-VAN implantation. Um, and their hypothesis was that cardiac CT will allow RV evaluation with higher feasibility and reproducibility compared with echo post LVAD. Um, so they looked at 36 uh, patients uh, who had an LVAD placed and had a cardiac CT and echo performed within two days of each other. Uh, this, these are the echo parameters. They looked at RV fractional change, step C, and RV and diastolic short to long axis ratio, which we typically don't use. The tissue Doppler was. This is a study from 2011, so RV free wall tissue Doppler was not included in the study. And you can see, you know, anatomically, you can see the LVAD really well um, with, uh, with uh, the, here's the planning scan and uh, here's uh, uh, reconstructed images showing your um, inflow cannula, the heart mate device, and then, then the outflow cannula. So um, the anatomical, um, uh, delineation is really crisp and clear cut and echo we are kind of struggling um, with some of that. So to look at the reliability of CT for evaluation of RV function in these LVAT patients, again they looked at the intra-observer and inter-observer availability with land uh, Altman plots. This is RV ejection, this is for RV ejection fraction concordance by CT and the intra-observer and inter-observer availability was excellent again. This is the mean and then these are the 95% conf confidence intervals. Um, so they're averaging on the x-axis the RV ejection fraction from the first and the second measurement for the intra-observer and then observer one and two for the inter-observer. Um, this is the problem they highlighted with the echo uh, where the readers graded the quality of the echocardiograms pre-LVAD and then after LVAD. Pre-LVAD, 60% um, of them were uh, graded as good quality, but that drops to 15% post-LVAD, and um, that's just a function of all the hardware that's there. Um, out of the different parameters that they tried to uh, look at, a correlation of CT parameters with uh, echo parameters, the RV fractional area change had the best correlation with CT derived RV ejection fraction with a correlation coefficient of 0.8. Um, here's the RV ejection fraction on CT, and then uh, on the y-axis, here is the RV fractional area change. But there was poor correlation for both the TAPC as well as the ratio of the short to long axis. Another advantage of doing CT in these patients is that it can also pick up on other findings. So in this study, uh, half of their patients, 15 patients, had other relevant post-op findings as well that were picked up on P uh, CT, and they include cannula malposition, intracannula thrombus, slow flow in the left atrial appendage or left atrial thrombus, pericardial effusion, um, anterior mediastinal hematomas, and lung infiltrates. And here are some examples of that. Here's uh, low attenuation um, regions in the outflow cannula, indicating thrombus in the outflow cannula. Here is malpositioning of the um, inflow cannula because it's butting against the interventricular septum here. Um, and here's a large uh, anterior mediastinal hematoma, and then there's a left atrial appendage clot. So it can help uh, pick up some of those things as well that are obviously clinically relevant. This is a echo that was done post LVAD uh, on a patient at our hospital um, just last month. Uh, this is a 73-year-old uh, male who had and LVAD implanted uh, two months ago for non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. So the peristernal uh, long axis view, you actually have a quite a decent view of the right ventricle. Uh, but then the tech is trying her best to give you some sort of view from a modified apical view, and then she labels this as five chamber. But you can see the RV evaluation is challenging from this view. Um, but nevertheless, this echo was read as having normal RV size with mildly repressed RV function, um, which actually doesn't look bad here. Now, so they, they ordered a CT um, subsequently for evaluation of RV function in this patient, and I'm showing you the uh, images here on the CT. Um, the uh, 
four chamber view, uh, you can see the RV free wall for the most part you can see pretty well except when you start to get towards the apex there is more artifact because of the device sitting there. Um, but if you look at the short axis images at the base made at the apex for the most part uh, you have reasonable delineation of the endocardial boundaries for the right ventricle um, and uh, the uh, calculation of RV ejection fraction on this um, patient was 40%, which would fall in the mildly depressed category. And, but the, the, the volume indexes showed that the RV was uh, mildly enlarged. Um, so next we'll move on to another indication, potential indication for CT, which is evaluation of ARVD. Um, this is a paper that's frequently quoted in CT literature uh, for utilization of CT for ARVD. This is from JCCT 2013. It's a study from Japan where they tried to propose a comprehensive CT scoring system for the diagnosis of ARVD. And I'll show you in one of the slides what their scoring system was. Um, and uh, they tried to compare that scoring, uh, uh, their scoring system with the 2010 modified task force criteria for um, ARVD. This was a retrospective study where they looked at 77 patients over the last four years who had a CT done um, with and without contrast for diagnosed or suspected ARVD based on ventricular uh, arrhythmias. Um, and um, the, uh, the uh, aim was to come up with their scoring system and then to evaluate its uh, utility against the modified 2010 task force criteria, which is a large <laughs> number, a l amount of information. This is the 2010 modified task force criteria, but just want you to be aware that imaging is only one part of it. And in imaging, they talk about uh, MRI findings and echo findings. So CT is not officially in these findings. But in imaging, uh, the, uh, you, know, you can go through these criteria, but it's based on RV end systolic and end diastolic volumes, um, uh, RV ejection fraction, for example, less than 40% is a major point, 45 to 50% is a minor point. Um, and then also looking at uh, RV uh, areas of RV dyskinesis, akinesis, or, uh, of, uh, or RV aneurysms. And we can look at a lot of those things uh, from a retrospectively gated CT that can uh, look at RV function and volumes. The other things that go in this um, modified uh, 2010 criteria is uh, tissue biopsy results if they are available, uh, a lot of EP information, including repolarization abnormalities, depolarization and conduction system abnormalities, arrhythmias, and family history. Definitive diagnosis of ARVD is if you have two major or one major and two minor criteria or four minor criteria from different categories, and then there is definition for borderline diagnosis and possible diagnosis. So this is the scoring system that they came up with in this study. Uh, they looked at fatty infiltration of the right ventricle and the interventricular septum and gave it either two points and one point. If there were multiple areas of fatty infiltration, they gave it two points. Or if there was thinning of the entire RV wall with no myocardium that could be seen, they gave it two points. Um, bulging of the RV free wall, which would be areas of RV free wall aneurysms. Uh, they gave two points if it was more than five millimeter in depth and minor if it was uh, one point if it was less than five millimeter. And then dilatation of the right ventricle, which they made on a four chamber view um, uh, close to the tricuspid annulus. Um, these are some of the representative pictures from um, their paper. So on a non-contrast scan here, you can see here is there are areas of fat here in the RV free wall towards the apex that you can see here on the post-contrast images as well. Uh, so that's fatty infiltration. Um, here's an um, area of uh, bulging in the RV free wall. Um, this was more than five millimeters, so they called it uh, as major with assigned it two points. Um, and this is a case uh, they describe in the paper um, and this was a case that had pathological diagnosis of ARVD, so a 65-year-old male who had six out of six, uh, a score of six out of six according to their proposed scoring uh, system. Um, so there's RV dilatation, there are areas of um, RV uh, bulges here, um, there is some fatty infiltration seen as well, uh, and then of course the biopsy proved that. So. Um, 
in this series, 23 patients had a definite diagnosis of ARVD based on the 2010 criteria, and four patients had a diagnosis of borderline ARVD. But this is the key things. If they had a score of four or, four or more according to their scoring system, um, the diagnostic uh, ability parameters are listed here for uh, correlation with definite diagnosis of ARVD uh, with the 2010 criteria. So if you have four or more points with the scoring system, you had a sensitivity of 87%, specificity of 94%, positive predictive value 87%, and negative predictive value of 94% for uh, a definitive diagnosis of ARVD. Um, the 2010 ACCHA appropriate use criteria uh, uh, mentioned that cardiac CT is appropriate for the evaluation of suspected ARVD, but they also mentioned it should be reserved for patients with inadequate echo images or contraindications to MRI. And all these different things that are in the imaging uh, parameters of the criteria can be assessed with CT, RV dilatation, EF, wall motion abnormalities, and RV fatty infiltration. This is a case that was just scanned at our hospital last month. Um, and this is a 65-year-old female who was referred for a coronary CT uh, for chest pain. So this was not done as a retrospective study. So you can't look at the RV regional wall motion abnormalities because you don't have the CINE images. So these are diastolic images. Uh, but then in, uh, the patient had coronary artery disease, but then also it's interesting to see that this patient also has ARVD, and these are some of the features. Look at these bulges uh, or aneurysms of the RV free wall. The right ventricle is dilated, um, and that towards the apex, there are possible areas of fatty infiltration. Um, here uh, is a non contrast scan, the planning scan, and here's the scan after the contrast. These two are not exactly uh, in the same uh, location. But you can see even on the non-contrast scan, you can pick up these areas of fatty infiltration towards the RV apex, uh, and they are showing up here as well on the post-contrast uh, scan. Um, so um, that's how you, you know, those are some of the things you'd look at uh, uh, from a CT for ARVD. Um, lastly, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, uh, something that you sometimes see more so in radiology reports, which is the RV to LV ratio in acute pulmonary embolism. There's a lot of data showing that uh, RV-LV ratio, which normal ratio is around 0.621, a ratio of more than one um, on a CT done for PE is an independent predictor of adverse outcomes. Um, the ratio is typically made as the maximal uh, uh, dimension of the RV um, to LV on an axial view that best approximates the four chamber view. Uh, but as cardiologists, we can actually reconstruct the four chamber view easily and then mirror it off of that. Um, so uh, th this study uh, looked at the correlation of different uh, parameters on CT with uh, RV dysfunction in PE patients on echocardiogram. Um, so this was based on 557 consecutive patients who had CTs done for suspected PE, 7700 diagnosis of PE, and RV dysfunction was present in about 35% of them. So they looked at all these different parameters. They actually did the ratio based on the axial slices and after reconstructing four chamber images, uh, they also looked at RV to LV volume uh, and then some biomarkers and, uh, and actually the diagnostic accuracy for the prediction of right ventricular dysfunction and echo was the best by using this RV to LV volume ratio. But nevertheless, it's that takes more time, so it's pretty good even with uh, just your basic RV to LV um, axial um, ratio. So that is all I have. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>Uh, so uh, we will check going, uh, you know, in our scanners it's every 5%, right? So you load all the phases and then uh, visually you just see where the volume uh, is, the, the chamber size is the smallest, just like we do with the MRI software. And 
Sometimes it's hard because it could be, oh, is it 35% or 40%, but it's based more or, or on the visual uh, estimation. We don't really try to correlate EKG to see where the end systole or end diastole is. So it's basically, basically just going through the phases and looking visually where you think it's the largest and the smallest size for the chambers. Uh, so uh, there have been studies done where they did prospective, uh, looked at the evaluation of RV and LV function from a prospective scan with something called padding. So basically the full radiation was given in the typical diastolic phases, 60 to 80 percent, and then there was some uh, radiation given in like the 20 to 30 percent range again to pick up just the end diastole and end systole. Um, the data showed that it really did not reduce the radiation by that much. And then the second uh, caveat is that uh, you can never be sure if uh, you have missed the true ancestry because maybe in this patient it was at you know 15% or 35% and not 20 and 30 that you scanned. Yes, yeah, so you can do flash systole diastole, and actually we have a protocol for triple rule out where we're looking for uh, all three pathologies, including PE, and we flash for the right side, and then we flash for the left side, um, and you can, uh, so flash is a mode on our um, Siemens dual source scanner where it'll try to acquire all the information from a single heartbeat, and uh, you could try to flash for just diastole and then systole, uh, and if you are correct in predicting those phases, yes, you could you could get that information from a radiation dose that would just be one, two millisieverts. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> you have 15 minutes.